Okay, folks. Um, next up, we've got <coughs> appeasement. Um, and depending on how the timer works, I'm going to try and crush this with the Sudeten Land and the Munich Agreement, Munich Conference into one. But if it's too big a file to save, it'll be split over a couple. So, um, Chamberlain becomes Prime Minister of Britain in 1937, and his view is that Germany had every right to be upset by the harshness of the Treaty of Versailles. And it basically means with appeasement that if um, Hitler's views are reasonable, if his claims are reasonable, what he asks for, they can be met with negotiation and not force. And we can basically, any issues from Versailles can be solved by talking negotiation, basically. Um, Chamberlain was well aware that this was a risky strategy. Um, he knew it was dependent overall on trust and basically he he feels he's got to do it. He, he, we're going to look at this in a moment. Um, on top of that, it's worth noting, you know, the, the questions obviously often asked, what's the French view? France supported appeasement and they supported it because the Maginot Line was, was built. France felt safe behind this and they therefore felt as though they could, um, t you know, go along with this appeasement strategy. So. Um, appeasement itself. Why are people bag it? Well, the obvious one is it was, a, it was genuine grievances from the uh, Treaty of Versailles could be solved by talking. There was this view <coughs> that Germany had been very harshly done to. So in 1918, Germany was was you know despised in Britain. You know, but the, the view in Britain, the public opinion, has softened over the years. So you know, you've got 20 years on. And there's a feeling of it's been too harsh, we're being too cruel to Germany, Germany's got no chance, etc. So that would explain the view of, oh, they're just going in their own back garden with the Rhineland. And, you know, like why really Austria was just accepted. Austria was really a test of appeasement. And it was a genuine grievance of German-speaking people wanting to be with German-speaking people that could be, you know, solved through talking. Um, having said that, the people of... Britain and France, you know, if we haven't forgot World War One. It's still fresh in our minds. It's still there. So there's a genuine feeling of avoid war at all costs, and this is only really, <coughs> this is only really being strengthened by the Spanish Civil War in 1936. That it can be brutal. It can be devastating. Let's avoid war. Um, also, Britain was really in no position at all to deal with a war with Germany. We were still suffering from the depression and the effects of depression, so America coughs, the rest of the world get cold. We couldn't afford a rearmament program in the, in the, 19, in the mid 1930s. We couldn't do it. Britain was not in a good position in 1938 to deal with a war with Germany, right? On top of that, the League of Nations was obviously failing. It was collapsing. So after the failures of Manchuria and Abyssinia, Chamberlain's looking at it and he's basically saying, well, we're going to have to go down another path here. So he, his idea is he will develop like a personal relationship with Germany. It's called personal diplomacy. He will deal with it. He will get deals with it. Because the League of Nations can't. And as I've mentioned before, there was a, the real fear going on at the time was in Britain was, was about communism. So Britain, France, etc. We fear the spread of communism from the USSR, from Russia, across Europe. So strong Germany would be seen as a barrier that would stop that. They wouldn't get past the Germans. It would be like a buffer zone. However, the <coughs> there was warning signs there. Um, we know that Hitler is breaking promises. You know, from 1933, when he comes into power as Chancellor, he's breaking promise after promise. On top of that, Germany's, Hitler's almost like a spoiled child. And the appeasement program basically shows that Hitler can get whatever he wants. He's not going to ever be opposed by Britain. So he's sort of like a child who, you know, wants some sweets. Kicks off, gets the sweets. Then that becomes a toy. Then that becomes a bike. Then, you know, it just goes from there. So Hitler had really been encouraged by the weakness of appeasement. And there's also a view that the Treaty of Versailles, the countries within it, were being betrayed. So we're not just betraying the treaty, but we're betraying nations in it, like Czechoslovakia, as we're going to see. And with appeasement, it's just sort of delaying the inevitable. Hitler's getting stronger and stronger at all times. So we've got a bit of an issue here. All right, and this brings us to the Sudetenland. 
Um, Hitler wanted Czechoslovakia, and he, he has this view <coughs> of German-speaking people being with German-speaking people. So you've got um, a lot of German-speaking people in a part of Czechoslovakia called the Sudetenland. And if you look at a map of the Sudetenland, it's like a twisted horseshoe that goes around part of Czechoslovakia. And this is going to be his excuse. Now, Czechoslovakia had been created by the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. Um, so Hitler really hates this. It's a, it's a constant reminder of what the treaty had done and how it weakened Germany. Now, why would you want the Sudetenland? Well, it was strong. It was well defended. So it was like a natural buffer zone from Germany. right? It was a natural defense system. It was made up of mountains. It had pillboxes. It had minefields, it had barbed wire, it had 34 divisions of the Czech army also in there. Um, you had Skoda Armaments Works was there. So Skoda, before it was a car company, it was an armaments company. Um, you've also got natural resources like coal and lignite, which is a brown coal. So it stood to reason the Sudetenland was great. It, it, it was the, the gateway to Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia weren't a world power, but with the Sudetenland they would have been a handy little ally for Britain and France to have against Hitler and they had a chance of you know holding the Nazis off so Hitler basically does the same what he did with Austria as he did in um, he does the same in the Sudetenland he this time asks Conrad Henling the leader of the Nazis in the Sudetenland campaign you know kick off riots demonstrations and this is what happens the Sudetenland's thrown into turmoil there is uh, riots there's demonstrations going on and Hitler is in no matter what happens, Czech Nazi Party, you've got my backing, right? And basically, it leads to um, Chamberlain and Hitler having a meeting. So in September the 15th, 1938, Chamberlain would fly to Germany to meet Hitler at the Berchtesgaden, okay? And Hitler would tell Chamberlain he wanted all German-speaking parts of the Sudetenland to become a part of Germany, right? after plebiscite so anywhere not the entire Sudetenland the German speaking bits after we have plebiscites now Chamberlain goes and gets the French support for this France backs it and then he goes to the Czech president Benesch and gets him to accept this deal as well now Benesch is in a no-win position here because it's now showing to him Britain and France aren't going to back him up right he cannot depend on British and French support and really his only alternative would have been to turn towards communist Soviet Russia and ask them for help, which he was reluctant to do. So Chamberlain would go back to Germany on the 22nd of September at Gottesberg and he would ask, he would basically meet Hitler again. And Hitler gets the shock of his life because he didn't expect France and Czechoslovakia to, to give in to these demands of like German speaking parts of the Sudetenland and he didn't expect this. So Hitler wants more. <coughs> right and he says actually the deal's changed I don't just want the German speaking bits I want the entire Sudetenland and there'll be no plebiscites so Chamberlain <coughs> incredibly disappointed incredibly deflated went back um, to Britain right Hitler was basically trying to provoke a war at this point all right and Chamberlain goes back to Britain and the British reaction is we've got to start building defences against air raids because the aeroplanes are advanced in this time and um, we've got to build trenches and um, evacuation of children is happening gas masks are being distributed so Britain was preparing for war and Chamberlain's issue apparently when he was flying back into Britain he thought how am I meant to explain to the British people that we are going to possibly be going to war over a land that nobody knows where it is. You ask the average person in Britain where Czechoslovakia was, they didn't know. And over a people, we've got no understanding of the Czechs. They didn't understand. So Chamberlain was in a quandary. Now, he got a note from Hitler, and he was invited to a four-power conference in Munich. So this is the Munich conference. This is the Munich agreement. Um, the four powers who will go, <coughs> a Chamberlain for Britain, Hitler for Germany, Mussolini will go for Italy, and Deladier for France. There is no Russian representation. There is no Czech representation at this conference. So the Russians have had their nose pushed out. <coughs> the Czechs aren't even going to get a say in what happens in their own country. And on the 30th of September, 1938, it is agreed the Sudetenland will become German. Um, we, Britain and France then say to the rest of the Czechoslovakia, we've got your back. 
we guarantee and the Czechs had no real um, choice but to accept um, Chamberlain would then go to meet Hitler in private and he says that you know we will never see a war between Britain and Germany again um, all future problems will be solved with this personal diplomacy consultation and this is this, this piece of paper the Munich agreement that Chamberlain was proudly waving as he returned to Britain because he was seen as a, a, a hero who diverted war by many even though the British public weren't trusting Hitler so Hitler had got the Sudetenland again he hadn't lifted a finger no fighting no warfare right so he'd done it by politics Czechoslovakia had been betrayed so one of the nations from the Treaty of Versailles had been let down okay and um, Chamberlain um, he's, a, he's a hero in many people's eyes um, <coughs> he's come back he's waving the piece of paper nobody wanted a war um, a lot of people were, were quite happy with this public opinion polls have said that people didn't trust Hitler they didn't think he was finished there and you'll see the likes of Winston Churchill would question Chamberlain more importantly um, Czechoslovakia had lost the Sudan land they were now vulnerable to invasion 34 divisions of the Czech army had gone the mountain range which was a natural buffer zone gone the pill boxes and the um, barbed wire the minefields and it is set up gone scorer armaments produce weaponry is now in german hands and they've got the coal and the lignite which speeds up their industry britain will start to rearm from here it's worth noting as well that the sudetenland was again popular according to um what records there are a lot of the, the german speaking people were over the the moon they made their voices heard and there is home video footage of the german soldiers going into sudetenland to see the crowds in the streets celebrating this perhaps key from this as well is russia stalin felt as we've been betrayed they've been left out of the conference they had no say this in <coughs> czechoslovakia is pretty close to eastern europe <coughs> it's got links to eastern europe russia sees itself as the power there and they've been left out of the conference so this is going to cause a paranoia with stalin who is the leader of the ussr and they feel as though they're betrayed so they, they are questioning what exactly is going on there okay hope that clears it up thanks for watching